Better? Ah, perfect. Well, my name's Steve Goodwin. I'm the Dean of the College of Natural Sciences here at the University of Massachusetts, and it is really a pleasure to welcome you to today's program. It's very exciting to see all of you here. This is really the first and what we hope will be a long series of college events to explore and celebrate women in the sciences as part of a women in sciences initiative in the College of Natural Sciences. Um, you know, what we really want to do is just to visibly increase uh, discussion and learning around the value of women scientists and best practices for supporting women science across the college. And I'll be honest with you, things are happening awfully fast. Just this week, for our Tuesday, I met with the Women's Faculty Caucus, a group of faculty members who are organizing currently to start to address some of these issues around gender. Earlier in the week, a group of undergraduate women students participated in a seminar in preparation for a time to think about organizing an undergraduate organization for women in the sciences. And today, after this uh, presentation, graduate students will be meeting, and I want to get this right, in room 162 to discuss forming a graduate women in sciences organization. There will be food and all graduate women in the sciences a welcome to attend. So that's room 162 after today's activities. Um, Sally Powers is always very, very helpful in preparing these notes and getting me ready for this. And in this case, she knew that I wasn't all that good with names, so she decided she'd send me the phonetic pronunciation. And in Sally's phonetic pronunciation, the last syllable is J apostrophe N-A, which I have absolutely no idea how to pronounce whatsoever. So for today, it's going to have to be Buju or Dr. Desgupta. <laughs> now, Dr. Desgupta has a very distinguished career here at the university. She's been funded by the National Science Foundation, including a career award. She's been funded by the National, Institutes of Mental, National Institute of Mental Health. Especially interesting to me is she's received several prizes. First is the Hidden Bias Research Prize for her groundbreaking research on gender equity in the classroom. She's received the Wayne F. Plastic Award from the American Psychological Foundation and the Morton Deutsch Award from the International Society for Social Justice. This past summer, I think in August, she participated in a small conference at the White House to talk about effective ways to increase participation of underrepresented youth in technology. And I think it's really exciting. Bush has been with us since 2003. And before I finish this introduction, I actually want to make a small confession. When I first came here in 1986, and they told me, well, I couldn't be a role model for women, I was hurt. I thought to myself, what's going on here? I'm a good scientist, I'm a hard worker, my wife and I were working hard to raise a family together. I'm saying, why can't I be a role model for women in the sciences? But the truth of the matter is, there's lots of good reasons for it, and there's lots of empirical evidence. And as a scientist, I have to accept the empirical evidence. So it's really a pleasure to um, welcome Buju here today to tell us about stemming the tide, how female experts and peers act as social vaccines for girls and women in STEM. Bushu. So just in case you're wondering how to say uh, my real name, it's Nilanjana. Um, yeah, I sent Steve the phonetic thing, and I was wondering how it would turn out. So, but I answer to both Buju and Nilanjana. Um, sometimes these introductions almost don't uh, sound, sound like me. So it was one of those glowing introductions where I think, is this, is this really about me? Um, so my graduate students and I have been thinking for a long time about girls and women in science, technology, engineering, and math. So it's really good to be here giving this talk. I've given variations of this talk elsewhere, but most of the data I'll talk about today were collected here. So I'm really interested in your thoughts, your feedback, your comments, questions, because a lot of that then becomes the next generation of research that we do um, in my lab. So. Um, 
Let's see. So one of the things that I want to do today is to start the talk in a somewhat unusual way, perhaps in a bit of a circuitous way, by saying something more general about how the human mind works, how we make decisions and judgments, and then you'll see it'll all end up uh, with the topic today. So humor me for, for a few minutes. Um, one of the most fascinating things about the human mind which got me into psychology is that a good part of human thinking and decision making happens very unconsciously, automatically, kind of like a computer's operating system that's running silently in the background of our mind while our conscious thoughts are like the software applications that run in the foreground. So mental processes like memory, perception, learned associations comprise this unconscious system and this system guides much of our judgments and decision making, often without our awareness and intention. Now typically, this unconscious system is very adaptive, it's very efficient. It allows us to process huge amounts of information in very little time. Um, but there are some times when this unconscious system leads to errors in perception that I called I call mind bugs. So and these mind bugs are at the heart of my talk today. So let me begin kind of sort of illustrating to you what these mind bugs are about by showing you some pictures. Take a look at these two images. Are they the same or are they different? If you haven't seen these images, they look virtually identical. If you have seen these images, you know that they are not the same. The one on the left is the original Mona Lisa, the one on the right is grossly distorted. But when it was turned upside down, you didn't see these distortions because your visual system registered the image it was expecting to see. Our memory for human faces acts as a template or a filter, and that filter influences how we perceive reality. And this is a great example of a mind bug. Here's another one. Are these lines parallel or are they crooked? I've seen this image a hundred times. Every time, these lines look crooked to me. But if you look closely, of course, these lines are parallel. Now this, your reaction to them and my reaction to them, illustrates another important quality about uh, errors in perception or mind bugs. That some errors in perception happen in a way that are difficult to control. You may know what the right answer is, but it's hard to override your gut reaction that these lines are crooked. So these visual illusions, which is what they are, and our reactions to them, illustrate some important qualities about human thinking and decision making. First, they illustrate that the way we experience, evaluate, and perceive the social world can often be full of errors. We may feel very confident about our judgments, but it turns out confidence doesn't correlate very well with accuracy. Second, they illustrate that our preconceived expectations influence our current judgments. Our assumptions influence how we judge things in the world. These mind bugs are normal or ordinary in sort of three senses of the word. They are ordinary because they are the byproducts of normal mental processes. They are the byproducts of the cognitive machinery we need. So things like memory, perception, learn, learned associations. They are also ordinary because all of us are prone to these errors. None of us are exempt from it. And they are also ordinary because these errors are unintentional. They occur without our awareness and sometimes they occur uh, without our control. So there's another kind of mind bug that gets closer uh, to our, our topic today, which has to do with learned associations. The idea is that some concepts automatically go together in our mind because we've learned those associations simply by being immersed in our society. So a very simple example of this that has nothing to do with people or groups is the idea that as kids grow up in a particular language culture and learn a language, we learn to associate particular words with particular, I should say, particular colors with specific words. So as English speakers, when we see the color red, the word R-E-D pops into mind. It's quick. It's automatic, this association is so learned and overlearned that in our mind it's not even an association. It's as if the, the, the color and the word is one and the same. So just to illustrate to you how strong this association is and to make my point, I'm going to do something kind of unusual in this uh, big sort of group. I'll ask you to humor me for a few minutes um, and I'm going to do a demonstration with you. So what I'm going to do is to show you a bunch of letter strings in different colors. 
they'll be arranged along, the, along columns. And I want you out aloud, as quickly and accurately as you can, just say the color that you're seeing. All right, you ready to play? All right, don't get self-conscious. It's, it's very, it's, it, it'll, it'll all make sense in the end. All right, so you're going to see these columns printed in different colors, and all I want you to do is out aloud say the colors you're seeing. Ready? Go. Green, red, brown, as fast as you can. Okay, so this is simple, it's so simple, it's trivial, and it's so trivial that probably many of you feel foolish doing this. But the flip side, and the reason why I wanted you to do it, is that this association between color and words is so strong that it's very hard to break this association. So I'm going to show you the same task with a little twist. I'm going to show you the same letter strings or similar letter strings printed in the same colors, but this time the words will spell out real words. I want you to simply ignore the words you're reading and just tell me the color of the ink, all right? Ignore the words and just tell me the color of the ink. Ready? All right, go. <laughs> I love this. It works every time. It worked at the White House with the tech people who thought this would never happen to them. But So this is a Stroop task, as many of you know. And it's, it, the, the elegance of it is that it shows that once you have that strong association that you don't even, are not even aware of, once I try to interrupt it, it's very hard to interrupt. The idea is that just as we associate colors with specific words, in our culture, th simply through observation, we learn to make other kinds of associations. Those associations are equally tight, equally strong. They are simply learned by who we observe. It's kind of, for people who are in computing, it's kind of like pattern matching. What you see is what you learn. So when you, th when you think of people in uh, specific professions and what people pop into mind, if you think of people in science, technology, engineering, and math, who pops into mind? Probably people like this. Or in this generation, people like this. Or perhaps in the next generation, people like this. In other words, our strong, learned, automatic association is that the quintessential successful person in science, engineering, technology, and math is male, mostly white, sometimes Asian, brainy, nerdy, geeky, socially awkward, you could go on and on. Notice what's missing are the girls and women. These associations, overlearned associations, are mind bugs. They are inaccurate caricatures and overgeneralizations that go beyond the one most important quality that we should care about in the academy and in industry, which is talent and ability. And in social psychology, we call these implicit stereotypes, sometimes implicit bias. The reason why implicit stereotypes matter to us is that they prevent the broad participation of different kinds of group groups in STEM, and they do this in two ways. One is that implicit stereotypes unintentionally influence decision makers' judgments about who is talented, who is likely to succeed, who is worth giving a break to, who is worth hiring or admitting. Another way implicit stereotypes influence us is that they influence individuals' own decisions and choices about what academic and professional paths to follow and what other paths to avoid. In today's talk, I'll focus on this latter uh, point because there's so much data I'd like to present to you, and I leave the former uh, consequence, which I think is incredibly important, for a different talk uh, on a different day. So let's talk about the role of implicit stereotypes um, in guiding academic and professional choices. So I should say that the, the, f the beginning point that I want to make is that, is that we often tacitly assume um, that individuals' academic and professional choices are free. They're free choices driven purely by the individual's talent and uh, intrinsic ability, so their fire in their belly, unconstrained by societal forces. But 
the data from my lab show that these choices are not free. In fact, they're heavily constrained by individuals' feelings of whether they belong or fit in in a given academic or professional setting. Um, humans are social animals. Um, in order for us to pursue something or choose to live in a particular world, ability is not enough. Ability doesn't determine our choices uh, as the only factor. Belonging matters a lot. Uh, we tend to gravitate towards academic and professional worlds where we feel we belong, we feel comfortable, we feel we fit in. And we tend to move away from other worlds where we feel uncomfortable, where we feel awkward, where we feel like we're standing out like a sore thumb. In other words, it's a combination of ability plus a sense of belonging that determines individuals' decisions to pursue STEM. So feelings of belonging in an academic and professional world increases when people see individuals like them in a given setting. And in contrast, feelings of belonging plummet when individuals don't see people like them in that setting. In our work in my lab, we look at women and girls in STEM. Uh, and what we do is we vary the visibility of female experts and peers in uh, STEM-related environments, um, and we look to see whether that variation influences students' belonging, whether it influences students' academic interests. So in many, I, I love metaphors, in many ways I think of this as a vaccine metaphor. So just as a biomedical vaccine protects and inoculates individuals' physical body against noxious bacteria and viruses, so too, for girls and women, contact or exposure to female experts and peers acts as a social vaccine that protects their mind against noxious stereotypes. So female peers and experts for girls and women act as social vaccines. That's the hypothesis we started with. And over the past seven or year, eight years, we've tested this hypothesis in many ways in many situations. And what I'd like to do is to tell you about some of those data. In one of our early studies, uh, we wanted to ask the question, does exposure to professors who are female or male in a STEM-oriented class, does that influence have different effects on women's academic self-concept and sense of belonging in that class? Um, so I went over to the Department of Mathematics, made friends with the associate chair, uh, George Avrunin and Arlene Norkin, and with their permission, conducted this longitudinal study where we recruited a bunch of students, men and women, from an intro calculus class that's a gateway to all physical science majors on our campus. Um, and we've we followed them, we recruited them at the beginning of the semester, and we followed them all the way till the end of the semester. Um, the beauty of this class is that there are multiple sections of this class. We recruited a bunch of students from some sections taught by female professors who had been paired with female TAs and another bunch of sections where the instructor was male paired with a male TA. None, oh, I should say, the, the professors and the TAs had been chosen because they were equated for their teaching experience and their teaching style. None of the instructors and none of the students were aware of our research hypotheses. And the, there were two sort of beautiful things about this class that made it perfect for uh, um, as controlled a setting as possible. One was that the students pre-registered for this course well before the instructors had been assigned. So it's not as if the students could self-select into the sections of their favorite professor, right? So self-selection bias was close to zero. Um, and also, the other beautiful thing about this class is that all the sections had the same syllabus, the same exams, and grading was done without knowing the identity of the students and was shared across all the sections, right? And students knew that. All right. So the research design, just to recap, is that the professor's gender varied, male or female. The student's gender varied, male or female. Students' responses were measured at two time points, in the beginning of the semester in September or at the, and at the end of the semester in December. So what did we measure? We measured a bunch of things, and I'll focus on the following. We measured students' attitudes towards mathematics compared to a humanities discipline, English in this case. We measured this in two ways. One that you'll be very very familiar with, which is your standard survey instruments, where we ask to 
students, how much do you like math? How much do you enjoy it? How, how, um, how fun or interesting is it? So these are what in our field we call explicit or self-reported attitudes, where you simply ask people and they tell you how they feel. We also measure attitudes a different way, in a much more indirect or unobtrusive way, because the idea is that sometimes we may not know the entirety of our thoughts and feelings about a given topic. So in this case, we measured students' implicit, sometimes called unconscious, attitudes using this rapid reaction time task. So the way the task works is that the student sits at a laptop, they are told this is a rapid reaction time task, we are measuring your hand-eye coordination which is not something we're measuring. Um, and they see these words flash up on a computer screen one at a time. The words are either words related to mathematics, so words like computation, equation, um, uh, theorem, um, algebra, or words related to English, Shakespeare, poetry, essay, grammar. We ask them to categorize these words as quickly as they can using two de pre-designated keys. Now, interspersed among these words are other words, words that are good or bad in meaning. So words like laughter, warmth, sunshine, versus words like cold, fear, vomit. Nothing to do with math or, or, or anything else. Just good and bad words. And they are told, again, to categorize these, these words as good or bad using the same two keys. The task is, is engineered, no pun intended, in a way that good and math go together on one key and bad and English go together on the other key. And the software is, is programmed to simply measure how quickly people do this task. In another part of the task, we reverse the pairing. Now it's math and bad, English and good. And we again measure how quickly people do this task. The idea is that if in my mind math is good, that's my learned association, then that association should help me do the task faster when math good goes together, English bad goes together. But if in my mind, my implicit attitude is math is bad, math is scary, then that association should interfere with my performance just as your performance on the Stroop task. So my performance now should be much slower, I should make more errors when math and, and good go together because in my mind, math is bad, right? So the difference in the speed with which people are able to do these two variations of this task is an indirect measure of their implicit attitudes or implicit association about this task. So we measure their attitudes in both ways. We also measure their identification with math relative to English. Uh, again, we measure it by asking people their explicit responses, and we measure it as well by measuring how quickly they are able to associate math with me, I, me, myself, those kinds of words, versus math with not me, they or them. Um, we measure their confidence. How well do they think they're going to do in the class? Um, we ask them how much they identify with their professor. How much do they feel connected to their professor or not? We get their permission to get their final grade from the registrar's office. And we measure a bunch of different things. Today I'll just focus on the variables you're seeing that, that are in black and not grayed out. So let me show you what we found. Um, so I'll first show you the data for the students' implicit identification with math. How strongly do they associate math with me, right? So these are male and female students. Um, if I, can you see the laser at the back? All right. So the black bars are, I'm going to move there. The black bars, can you hear me? Yeah. The black bars are the female students, the gray bars are the male students, here are the female professors, here are the male professors. Higher numbers mean students are strongly identifying with math. What you see is that four female students, when they are in sections taught by female professors, they identify with math significantly more than when the professor is male. For male students, they identify with math equally regardless of the gender of the professor. We looked at their attitudes towards math relative to English, and it's a similar pattern of data. Female, female students, male students. Female students uh, implicitly like math and English equally, which is why the bar is closer to zero. They like math and English equally when the professor is female. They dislike math strongly and prefer English when the professor is male. Male students, 
like math and English equally, regardless of the gender of the professor. So both in terms of students' identification with math, how much math is important to me, and how much they like math, you get the same pattern. Female students are moving around as a function of the gender of the professor, as well here, but male students are not. We looked at what students expected, to, how they expected to do in the class. So this is sort of a measure of their confidence or self-efficacy. And what we found is exactly what you've seen before. Uh, women expected to do far better when they were in sections taught by female professors rather than male professors. Male students expected to do similarly, regardless of the gender of the professor. Now compare this graph, which is a measure of confidence, with their actual grade. What you see is that female students outperformed their male peers across all 15 sections of the class. Consistently in every section, regardless of who taught the class, women did better than men on average. But compare this to this. Even though they did better, their confidence was much more fragile, going up when the professor was female or, or relatively speaking, down when the professor was male. So in, not, in other words, it's not as if these women are not talented. They have what it takes. But what is much more variable um, is, is their confidence. All right. So why, I should stay here. Um, why do same-sex professors have this positive effect on women? That was one of the questions we wanted to ask. And our hypothesis going into it is that identification or feeling a sense of connection with a, a person, an expert of your own gender, is what makes students feel that they have what it takes to do well in the subject. So in other words, feeling connected to you makes me feel that I can do this myself if you and I belong to the same group. Um, so we measured how much students identified with uh, their professor. We also measured how well they thought they would do in the class. So we simply looked at how much these students identified with their professor at the beginning of the semester, and we looked to see whether that would predict or correlate with how well they thought they would do in the class at the end of the semester. Uh, and we, we looked at it separately for uh, women in sections taught by male and female professors. So what you see here is these are students, these are all women, these are women in sections taught by female professors, these are women in sections taught by male professors. On the horizontal axis is how much they identify with their professor, more, less. On the vertical axis is how well they think they're going to do in the class by the end of the semester. Self-efficacy means confidence. What you see is that if they happen to be in sections taught by female professors, the more they identify with her, the better they think they'll do. In sections taught by male professors, uh, the more they identify with him has no bearing on how they think they'll do. So this line is, is essentially statistically flat. In other words, a lot of women did identify with their male professor. It just didn't affect how confident they felt about their own ability. Um, all right. So this study focused on college women, and it sort of raised a question in our mind about whether the same phenomenon would happen for students who are younger. So is it the case that female STEM teachers, female teachers, serve as social vaccines for younger adolescent women or girls? Okay, I'm going to switch. So this is the question we, we turned to, to see if the social vaccine hypothesis would, would turn out to be, to be uh, supported in a younger population. And the reason why this younger population was of interest to us is that there's a lot of research showing that these gender disparities in science and math start to appear around middle school when kids hit adolescence. And before that, girls do equally well, sometimes better in math and science than their male peers, but around adolescence, the graph starts to change, um, and boys start doing better and becoming more interested in math and science relative to their female peers. Um, so again, I decided to make friends with the principal and superintendent of a public middle school, and we conducted this longitudinal study at a middle school in the eighth grade, and in this particular school, this was the year where students were introduced to physics and chemistry, so physical sciences. So we recruited a bunch of eighth grade kids, both girls and boys, uh, with their parents' permission, of course, and we tracked them from the beginning of the academic year in September all the way till the next June, till the end of the academic year. 
year. And we collected data from these kids at three time points in the year. Um, again, just like the calculus study, these students were recruited from multiple sections of this class, and some of these kids happened to be in, si in sections where science was taught by female teachers, and other kids happened to be in sections where science was taught by male teachers. And all of the students and the teachers were unaware of our hypotheses. We measured, again, a bunch of variables. Today, I'll focus on three. We measured students' implicit stereotypes about, about science. So, to what extent did they think science is a boy's thing or a girl's thing or science is something that both boys and girls do? And we measured this using that rapid reaction time task and using surveys. But the most interesting data were those implicit tasks, so that's what I'll talk about today. So we measured essentially the speed with which they associated science with boys or science with girls. Um, and that would be a measure of whether they have stereotypes at that age or not. We also measured their implicit attitudes towards science. How quickly or easily did they associate science with good versus English, again, our comparison uh, subject with, with good. And finally, we measured their implicit identification with science. How quickly did they associate science with me versus science with not me? So let me show you what we found. All right, is it still working? Yeah, good. Um, all right, so these are the girls, okay? These are the girls in sections taught by female teachers. These are girls in sections taught by male teachers. Higher numbers means they, the stronger their stereotypes. Higher numbers means they're associating science is a boy's thing, not a girl's thing. Numbers close to zero means science is gender neutral. It's as much a girl thing as it is a boy thing. What you see is that the kids who are in sections taught by female uh, teachers had no stereotypes about science. Science was gender neutral to them. But the kids who were in sections taught by male teachers, by the beginning of the academic year, they had pretty strong stereotypes that science was a boy's kind of thing to do. And that stayed significant all throughout the academic year. Boys showed a similar pattern of data, not quite as dramatic. So boys in sections taught by female teachers had no stereotypes about science. Science was gender neutral to them. But boys taught in, in sections taught by male teachers showed significant stereotypes. Now science was a boy's thing. But notice that girls develop these stereotypes far more than do boys. We looked at students' implicit attitudes towards science. How much did they like science? How quickly did they associate science with good relative to English with good? So here are the girls. Numbers on the vertical axis are all negative. What that means is that on average, these girls are, are preferring English over science. Right? So their, their association of, of English with good is far stronger than their association of science with good. But also notice that the gender of the teacher matters. That when the teacher is male, their implicit attitudes towards science and their preference for English is far stronger. When their teacher is female, that skewed preference for English over science is weaker. Boys also, on average, preferred English over science. But for boys, the gender of the teacher didn't matter. Although it looks like these, these two lines are different, statistically speaking, these two lines are essentially the same. So for boys, the gender of the teacher didn't matter. They liked English a little bit more than they liked science, but the teacher didn't make a difference. For girls, it made a huge difference. And finally, we measured their implicit identification with science. And here we found something that was a little bit unexpected in the sense that girls and boys showed the same pattern of results. And this is what it looks like. So here again are girls and boys in sections taught by female teachers, girls and boys in sections taught by male teachers. Negative numbers means disidentification from science. Numbers close to zero mean that they're identifying with science and English equally. So when the teacher was female, girls and boys identified with science as much as they identified with English. So both subjects was, were important to them. But when the teacher was male, over the course of the academic year, they started disidentifying from science. This is something that I thought would happen with girls, but I'm a little bit surprised that it's happening um, with the boys as well. So this is one of those things that I'm going to um, follow up in our, our future research. 
Um, all right. So for both the, the uh, middle school study and for um, the college study, our focus was on real contact, right? Real contact between teachers or professors um, and these girls or, and, or women. Um, the, the question that I wanted to pursue next is what happens in classes where there are very few women or, or uh, female teachers or professors? In that case, what happens if contact is very difficult? Might it be the case that other forms of exposure to female scientists scientists and engineers, like media exposure, might have a positive effect. So in the following study, we came back to the, uh, to the college level. So we came back to UMass. And this time, I went to the College of Engineering. And, and the question that we wanted to ask was twofold. One is, does media exposure to successful female engineers increase female students' positive attitudes towards engineering? And two, does such exposure affect their career aspirations? Um, so we recruited a bunch of women from uh, engineering across all um, engineering departments, and we brought them into our lab, and we randomly assigned them to one of three conditions. So this is sort of a straightforward experimental design. So either they were randomly assigned to uh, uh, a condition where they saw pictures of and read bio uh, professional biographies about female engineers who were successful, or they read about five male engineers who were successful. Or in the control condition, we described what engineers do, engineering innovations, but we made no mention of gender. So let me show you an example. So here's a female engineer we used. This is a real person. Uh, her name is Ayana Howard. She's an electrical engineer. The description talks about how she got interested in engineering. It talks about where she got her PhD. It talks about what she does now and how her kind of most uh, uh, interesting work has been at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory on the Mars rover. So people saw five descriptions of five different women. In the male engineer condition, they saw the same description. We swapped out the picture, changed the pronouns. The paragraph is virtually identical. We wanted to keep the content the same. In the control condition, they read about what electrical engineers do. They read about the Mars rover as, a, as an application of electrical engineering, but we made no mention of gender. All right. Then we asked these students, how much do you identify with the engineers you read about? How similar are you to them? All kinds of questions assessing their sense of identification or connection with these engineers. And then we measured their implicit attitudes towards engineering in a way similar to what you've seen before, their confidence in their engineering ability, how well they thought they would do in their engineering classes. We measured their career aspirations. What do they want to do after they graduated from UMass? Um, and a bunch of other things. So let me show you what we found. So the black bar in this graph represents women who had been randomly assigned to read about female engineers. The gray bar are women who read the same descriptions but now attributed to male engineers. And the white bar is the control condition. Notice that women who were in the female engineer condition were the only people who were showing significantly positive attitudes towards engineering. The other two conditions, if anything, were showing negative attitudes towards engineering. And what's kind of distressing about this is that these are students who are already in the major. And the fact that they're showing negative implicit attitudes, I wonder if it's a precursor of attrition. Unfortunately, we didn't follow these women over the long haul, so we don't know if these implicit attitudes predicted something in their future. We also then, I should go back, we looked at just the female engineer condition and looked at how much women identified with those individuals. And we asked the question, does identification with those engineers predict their confidence, their self-efficacy in their own ability? And would that confidence, in turn, predict their career aspirations? And this is what we found. So the more women identified with the female engineers, in turn, that correlated very strongly with their own confidence or self-efficacy in the field, which in turn predicted how much they wanted to pursue careers in engineering. This pattern of data didn't occur for the male engineering condition. 
So I've thrown a lot of data at you, so I want to sort of pull out the, a lot of the, the four main points that I think all these three studies, the calculus study, the middle school study, and the engineering study suggest. One, they suggest that increasing the visibility of female scientists, mathematicians, and engineers increases girls' and women's liking for these disciplines, increases their implicit identification with these fields, their confidence in their ability, and their desire to pursue STEM careers. Um, on the flip side, the invisibility of female experts undermines women's confidence in their ability, even if they have the talent. And I think this point is worth emphasizing. If you think back about the calculus study, that even the kids kids, even the women who were showing uh, good grades, so in terms of performance, they were doing very well, it's their confidence didn't go hand in hand necessarily with their performance. So the invisibility of female experts is what undermines women's confidence even if they have the ability. Um, I should say that for all of you who are male faculty in the sciences, I don't think contact with, with the teacher or the professor is the only player. I think that besides contact, clearly media exposure to successful female scientists and engineers has the same benefit. Um, so it's not who the teacher is or who the professor is, but who people see as doing the science or doing engineering. Um, and finally, feeling personally identified with those successful individuals is really key because that sense of connection or identification enhances young women's confidence, their sense of belonging in that world, which in turn affects what they want to do in the future. Let me take the same points and then turn it around a little bit and give you four concrete recommendations for our campus and for, I, I think, other kinds of campuses and perhaps even um, uh, K-12 uh, kids. One is that these data show that it's clearly very important to have more female professors and teachers teach these courses in science, math, and engineering, especially foundational courses that are the gateway to these fields. Because who people see determines what the discipline begins to represent for them. It, it, it affects whether they feel they belong there or they don't belong there. Girls and women need to see people like them in science, uh, technology, engineering, and math in order to feel a sense of belonging. Um, I think these data also suggest for all instructors, regardless of the gender of the instructor, we can all diversify the face of the science in our courses. So for example, this might involve highlighting uh, discoveries, innovations, applications that have been created by female scientists or engineers, and these can be sort of part and parcel of the content of the class. Because if, if we just teach the science without saying who the scientist or engineer is, the default assumption, because of the implicit stereotype, is that the scientist or engineer is male. So not saying anything means that this is a homogenous field. So what something that every instructor can do, regardless of their gender, is to highlight who does, who does this work. And here is the work, here is how it's cool and important, and here, who, here, is the, some, here is the person who does it. So diversify the face of science. Um, for, for people who are directors of undergrad studies or uh, graduate studies in STEM, these data suggest to me that it's important to create mentoring opportunities between female faculty and female students. This applies as much to graduate students as it does to undergraduate students. Mentoring increases students' feeling of connection with those experts, which is the first step that makes them imagine a similar future for themselves. Um, it also suggests for all of us who are advisors, um, let students see you as a real person, um, not as a sort of an idealized advisor who was always successful, because I think tacitly that's what students assume. But if they know about our career struggles, obstacles, self-doubts, and successes, then the path from where we were when we were students to where we are now as faculty becomes much more human, much more personal. Um, and that increases their sense of identification. Um, so these are four things that I think all of us um, can do. And I think this makes a huge, is likely to make a huge difference. So all of the data I've talked about is about experts. The people who are successful, who are already well beyond the student herself. 
So what about peers in, in, in STEM? Does the presence of female peers similarly function as a social vaccine for young women uh, in STEM? And if so, what gender composition of learning environments um, is most beneficial for female students? So this is the last bit of data I want to uh, tell you about. We wanted to, to sort of get at this question. We wanted to conduct a team learning study. So we went back to engineering, and we wanted to ask the question, what gender composition works best for female students in engineering? So um, we recruited a bunch of engineering students um, from all of these various departments uh, in, in the College of Engineering. We brought them to our lab, and we told them that they would participate in a team competition, a team engineering task where we would give them two problems, and as a team, they had to come up with the most creative and best engineering solutions. So these women, they're, the participants were all women. They came into the study one at a time, and we randomly assigned them into one of three teams that varied uh, as a function of gender composition. So we either assigned them to a female majority team where there were three women, one man, or a gender parity team where there were two women, two men, or a female minority team where the participant herself was the only woman with three other guys. What you should know, and what the participants didn't know, is that there was only one real participant in every team. All the other three people in the team were our stooges. They were, our, they were research assistants, they were engineering undergraduates who we had hired, and my grad students had incredibly well trained them to behave exactly the same way in every session. Right? So their behavior is essentially a constant. We are only interested in the behavior of the one woman um, who is the real participant. All right. So they came in, these women came in, they met their teammates, they introduced themselves to each other, and then we discreetly put, put them in separate cubicles, and we asked the real participant, the, the woman who had come in for this team learning study, how she was anticipating, how she was thinking about the team learning task uh, competition. Was she worried? To what extent was she unsure or sure? Was she feeling uh, confident or anxious about the team task? So in psychology, we call these perceived threat. We also asked them the positive version. How eager were they? How motivated did she feel? How determined did she feel about the upcoming task? So th these are items assessing challenge. How positively challenged does she feel? Then, after she finished answering this question, we, we put, her, put them all back in their teams. We let them go at it for about with two questions, two essentially two engineering problems, and they tried to, to solve the problems. And we measured how often the real participant talked, how, how many uh, solutions did she help generate, how confident did she seem, um, was she talking by herself, or did she have to be pushed to, to talk, or does she have to be invited to participate, and so on. Um, so that, those were our verbal engagement or participation items. And again, we measured a whole host of other things, but for today's talk, I'll just focus on these. So what we were interested in is would the gender composition of these engineering teams influence women's feelings of threat versus challenge before they walked into the team learning task, but after they had met their team, uh, um, teammates? And this is what we found. The black bar are women in the female majority teams. The gray bar are women in the parity teams. The white bar are women who are in the female minority teams, where she was the only woman with three other men. Higher numbers on the vertical axis means that she felt more threatened than challenged. Notice that the women felt significantly more threatened in anticipating working in an engineering, on an engineering challenge where all her teammates were men, but she felt significantly less threatened when there were some women in the group. Um, we wanted to see whether this effect depended on how senior or junior these students were, meaning did it matter if they were first year students in the major or versus if they were sophomores, juniors, or seniors. And so, we, so I'm gonna show you the same data disaggregated by their year in college. Now the black bars represent the first year students, the gray bars represent the sophomores, juniors, seniors, all collapsed together. Here are the women in the female minority teams, 
parity teams, majority teams. Notice that the women who are most threatened are the first years in the female minority team than the more advanced students. But notice also, somewhat surprisingly, women first years in the female parity team, there were 50% women, were also more threatened than the more advanced students. It is only when they were in teams where most of the people, 75% were women, where the first years didn't feel threatened. Um, so, so I think the takeaway from this particular graph is that for first year students, the team composition, the gender composition of the team matters the most. It matters less for students who are more advanced. Probably because they've already self-selected out if, if, uh, if their first year was too, was too, too much. So here is the, how much these students talked. How much did they participate? How, much, how many solutions did they generate in this team task? What you can see is just as we had predicted, the women in the female majority teams talked the most. They were most solution oriented. They had lots to say, much more than the women in the other two teams. And this, interestingly, didn't depend on their year in college. So first years, as much as more advanced students, had a lot to say on this engineering challenge if they were in female majority teams, but had far less to say if they were in parity or minority teams. So here are the four take-home points from, from these data. That team learning is good, it can be good, but there's an important caveat. That not all student teams are equally effective for women in, in science and engineering. Teams where women are a small minority can actually be harmful. Women feel most unsure and anxious in those teams. They're not too eager or motivated, and they become very quiet and talk very little, even if they know the right answer and can solve the problem. Um, in contrast, on the more optimistic side, women did best in female majority teams. They didn't feel anxious, they had a lot to say, they were eager and motivated, and they engaged in the team activity, both if they were first years and advanced students. Interestingly, women's experience in the gender parity team was more mixed. These teams worked great for advanced students, but they didn't work so well for first year students. So to me, the recommendations that come out of these data are four. One, for all of us who teach courses that involve team learning, these may be lab courses, these may be uh, our new integrated concentration in science that involves a lot of team learning, I would encourage instructors to pay attention to the composition of the te these uh, teams. Avoid teams where women are a small minority. Instead, create teams where women are at least at parity, and if at all possible, if the numbers permit, make some teams where women are in the majority. And maybe collect some data and see how things go. Um, the gender composition of these teams matters especially for intro level classes um, where that use these kinds of teams because that's where those are the students um, who are most affected by gender composition. I would also recommend that instructors structure the team learning exercise to ensure that all students get airtime and that a few students don't dominate uh, the discussion in the team. One way to do that um, is to structure the team task in a way that every member of the team goes away and then learns and masters some component that is essential to the problem solving activity they have to do as a team. And then each person comes back to the team and teaches the rest of the teammates about what they've learned. That allows every team member to be an expert for some moment in time and to be essentially the teacher. Uh, so she has airtime and she has expertise. Um, and there may be other ways to do that, but that's sort of one that, that jumped out at, at, at me. And finally, even outside the classroom, I think instructors, uh, departments, uh, even RAs in, in, in RAP dorms can structure, create multiple opportunities for female students to learn and interact with female peers to, so, that, so that these students can develop a sense of mastery and confidence. This may happen through peer mentoring, this may happen through advising groups, this may happen through local chapters of professional societies like Society for Women in Engineering, it may happen through this new uh, organizations that Steve was talking about uh, right the beginning. I think the more these peer-to-peer -peer interactions happen with a, with a substantial number of women in these interactions, the more likely it is that female peers will essentially be social vaccines. 
So let me go back and wrap things up by going back to the, the almost the beginning of my talk by emphasizing the tacit unspoken assumption we often have that, that all of our academic and career decisions were freely chosen, that our students' decisions are freely chosen. And if they switch out of the, the, the major, it was simply their choice because it's not Sim as simple as that. Um, students' decisions, our decisions, were not simply guided by ability and intrinsic motivation. It was guided also by other things like belonging. So I hope the data have, have shown you and persuaded you that for students who are numeric minorities, this may be women and girls, which is what I focused on, but in my new work, I'm actually very much interested in the intersection of race and gender. Um, but, for, but for students who are numeric minorities, Minorities and also stereotyped in a field, the decision to stay or leave is heavily influenced by invisible factors or seemingly invisible factors like the presence or absence of same-sex experts and same-sex peers. It is not solely determined by the individual's talent. Also importantly, one of the sort of main findings that I, that I, I didn't emphasize too much is that most of the data that were interesting in all these studies were in terms of students' implicit responses, not on their survey responses. What this means is that oftentimes students themselves were not aware, not conscious, about the different ways in which the people in their environment affected their own decisions to stay in the major, own decisions to pursue careers in the field or not. Nevertheless, we as a, an academic community, we as faculty, administrators, staff, um, we can be very conscious about changing these learning environments in order to enhance all students' sense of belonging um, in, in science and engineering and to diversify uh, the STEM pipeline here at UMass. Before I, I stop, uh, I want to thank a lot of people. Even though I'm the only person standing up here, really this research was done in collaboration with my graduate students. And without those students, the work would have never gotten done. So I want to thank Jane, who was a, a past student of mine who is now a postdoc, Melissa, who's sitting up here, Matthew, who has also graduated uh, and a research scientist, and Tara, who's sitting up here. I want to thank all my colleagues in mathematics and in engineering who opened the doors, went through my experiments, told me what would work and what wouldn't work. Um, graduate students in engineering who did a great a lot of coding of our data. Uh, teachers and administrators at a public middle school who opened the door and let us come in and collect data from their students. A whole posse of undergrad research assistants to your right, without whom these data would not have uh, been collected. These are really labor-intensive studies that take a long time to do. And finally, funding from the National Science Foundation. If they hadn't given me the funding, I would not have had the audacity to do this work. Thank you. Thank you.